It was a wedding that anyone would dream of, and I never thought my fiancé would suddenly cancel on me. And on top of that, I've found my true love, he said nonsensically over the phone. Yet, five years later, when we met again by chance, Do you want to try again? My ex-fiancé had the nerve to say, Well, I think it's time for some payback, five years in the making. My name is Maya. I am 28 years old and work in an office. At this age, wedding fever is in full swing among my friends. As each friend walked down the aisle, my own wedding was also on the horizon. I met my fiancé, Ryan, through work. We got to know each other on a project and started dating by the end of it. After three years, we finally decided to tie the knot. Three years felt like a lifetime. Especially since Ryan wasn't keen on getting married and just wanted to enjoy life. But with his thirties approaching and influenced by his friends' weddings, he finally decided to settle down. I was thrilled, as I feared we might enter our thirties without marrying or, worse, break up. So, I didn't mind the lackluster restaurant proposal and quickly said yes. Ryan has a stable job, he's funny, and kind. I had no complaints about him as a husband. I made sure to be seen as a worthy wife. Improving my housekeeping skills and cooking to a decent level. Even though it was a small wedding, it was important to me to have a ceremony. Ryan, who initially didn't care about marriage, agreed that it was a good way to mark the occasion. We couldn't spend much, so we planned a small party, but I was delighted. Planning the wedding and choosing a dress was a joy. After meeting each other's parents, the next step was to meet Ryan's friends. Nothing notable happened, it went smoothly. Most of Ryan's friends were married and had families. Creating a calm atmosphere. I wondered if marriage would mature the somewhat childish Ryan. Since we had met Ryan's friends, I decided to introduce him to mine. I wanted them to come to the wedding, so we went to a bar with a few friends. My friends, both men and women, said Ryan seemed nice and that we were a good match. Despite his initial nerves, Ryan soon relaxed in their company. After some drinks, I needed to use the bathroom and stepped away briefly. Hey, where's Ryan? He had disappeared in that short time. Looking around, Rachel felt sick and went outside, and Ryan followed to check on her. One friend said, Ryan's concern was typical of his kind nature, but I started to worry. Rachel was strikingly beautiful, yet still single. She always said, I'm looking for my soulmate. So I guess she hadn't found him yet. While I didn't think she'd go after someone else's fiancé, it's natural to feel uneasy. I went outside to check, and I froze. What are you doing? Ryan and Rachel were embracing outside the bar. Or rather, Rachel was clinging to Ryan's chest. What the heck are you two doing? When I called out in surprise, Rachel turned to me with a startled look, and Ryan looked a bit awkward. I felt something was off, but Rachel hurriedly smiled and rushed over to me. Sorry, I felt a bit dizzy and Ryan just helped me stay steady. Is that so? Are you okay? Yeah, I feel better after getting some fresh air. I'm heading back inside. With that, Rachel went back inside. When I looked back, Ryan shrugged and walked in silently. Something feels off. As if my intuition was right, Ryan's attitude started changing gradually. Even as our wedding preparations were moving forward, Ryan seemed noticeably distracted. Hey, do you think this dress is good? Yeah, I guess so. What about these wedding favors? Yeah, I guess so. The guest list. Yeah, I guess so. They're predicting heavy rain tomorrow. Yeah, I guess so. He's not listening at all, is he? It's our wedding, not just mine. He said we could go through with it as a formality, 
but his irresponsible attitude is really getting to me. Even though I'm frustrated with all the arguing leading up to our big day, I can't just abandon everything. I'm squeezing in time between my busy work schedule to meet with the planner and discuss the details. I never thought he could be so careless. One day, while I was feeling irritated with Ryan still being out of it. His smartphone buzzed on the table when he stepped out saying he had a stomachache. I glanced at it and was shocked to see a text from Rachel. What? Rachel? I'm pretty sure Ryan doesn't know anyone named Rachel. At least none of the friends he's introduced me to. Would he really save a work colleague or business contact under such a friendly name? Could it be my friend Rachel? No, that's impossible, I thought, but then another text came through. It said, where are we going for our date tonight? And another one said, I can't wait to see you. Love you. Oh, this must be what they call cheating. Not just women. Men can get cold feet too. Yeah, that's it. It's just pre-wedding jitters. But, can I really forgive that as an excuse? Still, I couldn't confront him in public, so I waited until our meeting was over. As we were leaving, I finally told the still distracted Ryan that I saw the texts. What's that about? Are you cheating? Ryan looked surprised. No. And said. You know, your friend Rachel. She had a fight with her boyfriend and asked me for advice to understand a guy's mind. While talking, she started saying she likes me as a person. Such a suspicious excuse. Even so, doing this behind my back. Though I wasn't convinced. If you don't like it, I'll stop contacting her. He said, so I decided to trust him. After that, Ryan got serious about our wedding preparations, and everything started going smoothly. However, as the wedding day approached, Ryan's attitude turned cold again. Hey, let's call off the wedding ceremony. What? What are you talking about? We can't cancel it now. But it feels like a waste of money. Didn't you say we should go through with it as a formality? Why the sudden change? Well, um... I was shocked by his sudden words and pressed him for a reason, but he evaded. His attitude only made me more frustrated. Can we really go through with this? When I consulted a married friend, it's probably just pre-wedding jitters. She said, men who have been free and easygoing often feel that way. Once you're married, they'll settle down. This was coming from someone with experience. I started to worry if that was the case when I was stunned by what I saw right in front of me. Is that Ryan and Rachel? The day before the wedding. I had worked late and decided to pick up some dinner on my way home, so I headed to the supermarket. And there, coming out of the entrance, was Ryan and Rachel, carrying grocery bags and looking very cozy. They didn't even notice me as they got into their car and drove away. I was so shocked I couldn't move. What was going on? I was completely bewildered. When I got home, I called Ryan, but he didn't answer. I sent a text saying, we need to talk, but he read it and didn't respond. Hey, aren't we getting married tomorrow? My anxiety reached its peak. The next day arrived, and it was the wedding day. The worst situation is that I can't fall asleep because I'm worried and I don't get enough sleep. Still troubled by what I saw yesterday, I arrived at the venue. The staff told me. Ryan hasn't arrived yet. I was shocked. Sure, it takes longer for the bride to get ready, but the groom should be here early too. It was almost time for the guests to start arriving. As I was getting anxious, my friends who were helping with the reception arrived. Congratulations! They all said, but I couldn't be happy. Seeing my worried face. What's wrong? One friend asked. When I told her that Ryan hadn't arrived yet, she was surprised. 
Now that you mention it, Rachel isn't here yet either. Rachel too? Yeah, she was supposed to help us with the reception today, remember? I was wondering why she hadn't contacted us. Hearing this, I told her I saw the two of them together yesterday. My friend, shocked, quickly called Rachel. I, getting even more worried, called Ryan again, but it went straight to voicemail, saying his phone was off. Why? I felt like crying, and my friend quickly said, I'm sure they just overslept. But even oversleeping is bad enough, I thought. Let's just get you ready, okay? My friend took my hand, with tears in my eyes, and led me to the dressing room. My parents, seeing my state, were surprised. When I told them Ryan hadn't arrived yet, Ryan's parents showed up. What is that foolish son of ours doing? They frantically tried calling him too, but it was the same result. Guests were starting to arrive, and I had to get ready. I was so nervous waiting for him, but Ryan still didn't show up. With just five minutes left before the ceremony. I'll go get him. One of Ryan's friends said. The staff tried to be accommodating, saying, We'll have a standing buffet until the ceremony begins. They said, trying to be considerate. But then, it happened. At that moment, my smartphone, which I was clutching tightly, rang. It was from Ryan, who shouldn't have had his phone on. Ryan, what are you doing right now? I yelled into the phone as soon as I answered. Oh, sorry, sorry came his completely unremorseful voice. Sorry for what? Next to me, my father-in-law Charlie, his face bright red, gestured to take the phone. Let me talk to him. I put the phone on speaker. What are you doing? The ceremony is about to start. Oh, Dad. I'm really sorry you came all this way, but I'm calling off the wedding today. Just get here now. Charlie yelled in fury, but in the end, he was speechless. I, my mother-in-law Betsy, my parents, the staff, and all our friends were equally stunned. Calling off the wedding, what do you mean? I managed to ask, my voice trembling. Ryan's voice, calm and cheerful. Well, you see, I've found it. Responded. Found what? True love. Huh? What is this man talking about? Today, he was supposed to pledge his love to me. Ryan! What are you saying? Your loved one is waiting at the venue right now. Betsy hurriedly interjected, but Ryan laughed on the other end of the phone. I could almost see his face lightly chuckling. Yeah, I met my true love. What? So, here is my true love. Hello, this is Rachel. Rachel. The new voice introduced by Ryan. It was unmistakably my friend Rachel's voice. Rachel said, I'm sorry, Maya. But don't blame Ryan. We truly love each other. If we had met before you and Ryan, we wouldn't be in this situation. But please forgive us. We can't control our feelings. We're serious about this. So, that's that. That's that? What do you mean, that's that? How can you just lightly apologize and think it's okay to steal someone's fiancé? Ignoring our stunned reactions. I'll cover the cancellation fees. Consider it a severance payment and compensation. Goodbye. Ryan said and hung up. I tried calling back frantically, but it went straight to voicemail, indicating the phone was off. That jerk turned off his phone immediately. Well, after that, it was chaos. Since it was a small buffet-style reception, no clients were present, but I had invited colleagues and my boss. Naturally, everyone was furious. But they all felt very sorry for me. Which made me feel even more miserable. Ryan's parents were on the verge of tears, apologizing profusely. 
But it's not their fault, it's Ryan and Rachel's. My friends were also furious saying, we're cutting ties with them. I suppose the dreamy couple won't care about losing friends. Since Ryan's covering the costs, let's just have a party. Someone suggested. We turned it into a consolation party for me, with drinking and singing. Maybe that's why, even though I was crying, I somehow managed to stop thinking I want to disappear from this world. If I had been alone, I might have been overwhelmed by the shock. After the party ended, I went to a bar with my friends. By drinking the night away, I somehow managed to feel ready to return to normal life. However, the incident of calling off the wedding on the day itself lingered, and I was treated with kid gloves at work for a while. Even my usually strict boss was overly kind. You can take some time off if you need to. It was almost creepy how nice they were. It was temporary. But eventually, going out for meals and drinks with friends every day lifted my spirits. In six months, I had completely recovered. However, an event occurred that threw me back into the depths. Yes, those two, Ryan and Rachel, again. Oh, I'm so tired today. Wait, what is this? Returning home from work, I found a cute envelope in my mailbox. I was surprised to see who it was from. It was Ryan and Rachel. What on earth? I almost fainted when I opened it. It was an invitation to their wedding. What kind of nerve do those two have? Inviting me. Sure, I knew both of them, but we had severed ties, and they were former acquaintances. Who in their right mind invites a completely estranged person to their wedding? Looking closer, it said, please bring a gift of $500 or more. Are you kidding me? I shouted involuntarily, tearing it up and shooting it into the trash can. Are those two living in a dream world? It seems they ran out of savings paying for our wedding that never happened. Trying to recoup it with wedding gifts? Don't invite your ex-fiancé for that. Apparently, the talk of the two became a hot topic among friends. Of course, no one attended the wedding. Maybe only people I didn't know showed up, but at least no one I knew attended. Even Ryan's parents called me after a long time. We're so sorry for our son. They tearfully apologized. I can cut ties, but blood relatives can't. I felt sorry for them. I have no idea what happened to those two after that, and I don't want to know. As long as they stay out of my life, I'm fine with it. I moved on and led a fulfilling life. Before I knew it, five years had passed since the wedding day cancellation incident. At 33, I was still busy every day. One day, for a change of pace, I went to the shopping mall. There's a bakery I love in the mall. I headed there with a light step. But I stopped in my tracks at the storefront. Why? Because there stood someone I never wanted to see, someone I wanted to forget, but a memory that lingered in the farthest corners of my mind. Ryan. Yes, my former fiancé. I was so relieved we never got married, I was glad we broke up before the wedding. He looked a bit older than I remembered. I should have turned and left immediately, but I regretted being frozen in shock. Maya? Ryan noticed me and rushed over. I couldn't run because the mall was crowded. I was caught so easily. Let go of me. Hey, long time no see. Meeting here must be fate, huh? No, it's not. Let go. I shook my arm, but Ryan's grip didn't loosen. Annoyed, I said. If you don't let go, I'll call security. He let go immediately. What a weak man. While I glared at him, Ryan smiled brightly. It was creepy. It's really been a while. You've gained some weight, haven't you? Well, you're middle-aged now. Shut up, leave me alone. This is the worst. 
Why do I have to run into this guy here, now? I cursed the coincidence. I wanted to leave quickly, but Ryan wouldn't stop talking. Look at me, still as handsome as ever, right? Without thinking, I said. Should I erase you from this world? I ended up saying it. Then. There's no way you can erase my handsomeness. He said, making me seriously consider if there was a weapons store in the mall. Well, of course, there wasn't. This isn't a movie where you can just find a weapons store whenever you want. Such a shame. I'm in a hurry. See you. I thought about leaving straightforwardly. Don't be shy. Are you that happy to see me? He said. How positive can you take my words? Is he crazy? Hey, meeting here must be fate. Why don't we get back together? What? What did he just say? Did he really say that? I couldn't help but frown and ask again. Then Ryan said, Let's get back together. He reached out his hand. I wished I had handcuffs. Even toy ones would do, just to cuff him and hand him over to the police. The crime would be something like, for being too gross to exist. What do you mean by getting back together? You married Rachel, didn't you? We broke up. I couldn't believe my ears. What? What happened to your so-called true love? Listen to this. If you can say it in one second. What? One second? Yes, time's up. Wait, at least give me a minute. Five seconds have passed. Well, she was a useless woman who couldn't do anything. She didn't do housework, didn't work, and we divorced after two years. There, within a minute. Why didn't you do the housework and work? If it was true love, you should have done that. Well, I lost my job. It seems that Ryan lost his company's trust because of the wedding day cancellation incident. He got sick of being looked down upon by his peers, started slacking off at work, and eventually got fired. You're unbelievably stupid. Hey, don't compliment me like that. It makes me blush. I wonder what part of that was a compliment. How's Rachel doing now? I don't know. She kept nagging about my unemployment. It's rude to say she was attracted to my income. So, Rachel married Ryan for his money. Back then, their income was decent enough for the two of them. When I told her to get a job if she wanted money, she said she was busy being a housewife. But she didn't do the laundry or cook. Of course, I got fed up. Then you should find a new job. Why? No, why is it a question of why you haven't found a new job? I stayed true to my love, but I was ridiculed and despised by those around me. In the end, I got fired. A wife should work for her husband, take care of the house, and let him rest. That's something a husband fulfilling his duties would say. But even if I said it, Ryan wouldn't understand. Both Rachel and Ryan are equally terrible people, and their divorce was inevitable. So much for your so-called true love. In the end, Rachel wasn't my true love. How can he say that after canceling our wedding on the day itself? It's outrageous. I'm angry, but it's a waste of time to be mad at this fool. I realize that you are the one I truly love. What? That's disgusting. I can't believe he'd say that to me. It's so gross it gives me goosebumps. Don't be shy. You still love me, don't you? No way. Hey, don't say that. I know everything. So, what are you doing now? Working? Of course I am. At your old company? Yes. It's been five years since then. Did you get a promotion? That's none of your business. So, you did get one. As expected of my girl. 
I was genuinely disgusted. What is this guy talking about? Is he seriously out of his mind? What does he mean by my girl? Even as a joke, it's in very poor taste. Did you perhaps focus on work because of the shock of me dumping you? If you got promoted because of that, you owe it to me. No need to thank me, just support me financially, and I'll forgive everything. Huh? Even if I had anything to forgive you for, why on earth would I need your forgiveness? Well, because you're having a good time living on your own without me. I couldn't understand his logic. Was he always this hard to communicate with? I rubbed my forehead. I was truly glad we never got married. Listen, I. Just as I was about to give him a dose of reality. I got a call on my smartphone at the worst possible moment. Seeing who it was, I couldn't ignore it. Hello. Hey, I'm talking to you, and you're taking a call? Shut up and be quiet, idiot. Glaring sharply at him, Ryan was silenced by my intensity. After confirming this, I turned my attention to the call. A worried voice came from the other end. I quickly reassured them. Yeah, I just ran into someone really annoying. Yeah, I'm fine. Are you okay over there? I heard lively voices from the other end, and it made me smile. Got it, sorry about this. I'll be home soon. Please take care of the kids, Andrew. With that, I ended the call. Looking back at Ryan, he was stunned. What was that? Huh? Kids? Dad? Oh, that. He must have heard the conversation. Ryan's body was trembling slightly. I laughed and told him what I had planned to say earlier. You know, I'm already married. What? And I just had twins six months ago. Look, here are my little angels. I showed him the screen of my smartphone, displaying two adorable sleeping babies. Married? Twins? How could you do that while having me? What are you talking about? While having you. There's not a single trace of you in my life. You don't exist at all. Giving him a cold look, Ryan's body trembled. Feeling humiliated, huh? Let's make him feel even more humiliated. In the past five years, I've hardly ever thought about you. Not even once in the three years since I married my beloved husband. Living happily alone? Yes, I'm very happy, but not alone. I'm with my loving family. I smiled at Ryan, who was gnashing his teeth in frustration. At first, I did throw myself into work to forget about you. But soon enough, I got so absorbed in my job that I completely forgot about you. I even met my now husband through work. Thanks to that, I became even more motivated and succeeded in my career. Get it? I don't need you in my life at all. In fact, you're a hindrance. I'm happy because you're not around. I pointed my finger at him. I've never needed you and never will. Now, get lost. And never contact me again. You're just a stranger to me. Ryan glared at me with an expression that could almost be heard grinding his teeth. But I held his gaze, staring back without backing down. If you keep this up, I'll call security. At that moment, Don't you dare! How dare you, a woman who was dumped by me! Ryan suddenly lunged at me, trying to hit me. His face twisted into a demonic, ugly expression. Could this really be the man I once loved and almost married? I thought coldly, he was unrecognizable. If I just stood there and let him hit me, it would give him a severe punishment. But I didn't want to get hurt. So I took a few steps back and prepared myself. Ryan charged at me with a wild scream, swinging his fist. Ryan screamed and spun around, falling to the ground. I hadn't done anything. 
I just dodged in time with his movement, and he fell on his own. What? What just happened? Ryan, unable to understand the situation, scrambled to his feet in confusion. I laughed and said, It's a form of self-defense. You avoid the attack and, well, usually you counterattack, but for self-defense, running away is the best option, I guess. Though I wasn't running now. Hearing this, Ryan's face turned bright red as he stood up. Don't mock me! He then tried to hit me again, undeterred. I'll teach you what happens when you make a fool out of me. I could see his movements clearly. It's been five years since we broke up, and I've experienced many things. One of those experiences was learning self-defense, which I started out of interest. Compared to the lazy, unemployed Ryan, his movements were in slow motion. As I prepared myself, I decided to lower my guard. Ryan looked surprised. Yes, that's right, just let me hit you. He shouted, raising his fist. But then, what are you doing? Several uniformed security guards grabbed Ryan, pinning him to the ground. Ryan couldn't resist, taken by surprise. Stop struggling. Someone call the police. Apparently, the security guards had heard the commotion and rushed over. Ryan was pinned to the ground. Are you okay? One of the security guards looked up at me with concern. I'm fine. I nodded. Then I crouched down to meet Ryan's gaze. Hey, it's not my fault. It's all Maya's fault. I'm not to blame. You're the one at fault. I cut him off coldly before he could finish. Ryan paled at my icy tone. What true love? What Rachel isn't my true love? What I truly love you? Maya, it's disgusting. You are seriously disgusting. Who would ever get back with you? I have a loving husband who loves me, and precious children I would do anything to protect. What makes you think you have any chance? Don't ever show your face to me again, you creep. Maya, don't say my name again. You're disgusting. I kept calling him disgusting, and eventually, his spirit broke. He lost the will to resist the security guards and slumped in silence. Later, the police arrived, and I explained the situation. Ryan was taken away. Unfortunately, he wasn't arrested because it was only an attempted assault. I briefly thought it might have been better to let him hit me, but I didn't want the pain. I didn't think he knew my home or cell phone number, but he might call my workplace, so I consulted a lawyer. I filed for a restraining order, which was granted. Some time later, I got a call from Ryan's parents, who I hadn't heard from in years. Apparently, they had disowned him after the incident five years ago, and now he had returned home and told them what happened. And then came the phone call where they apologized and talked about moving away. They said they couldn't bear to see their foolish son anymore, so they were secretly planning to run away in the night. Even as parents, they couldn't take responsibility for the actions of their grown son. I felt sorry for them. As for Ryan, he had disappeared without a trace, with nowhere to turn to and no way to support himself. He lost not only true love, but also any hope for a future. That's his own responsibility. Speaking of which, I heard from a friend that my former friend Rachel has also fallen on hard times. She had counted on Ryan's good income after taking him from me, but that plan fell through and she couldn't return to her parents' house. She ended up living in a world of night jobs. However, Rachel, who had always hated working, is now living a life of poverty. I saw her wearing old clothes, looking so haggard. But those words didn't stir anything in my heart. That's her own responsibility too. In exchange for so-called true love, she lost all the trust of those around her. As for me, 
I'm busy every day raising my twins. I don't have a moment to think about Ryan. During a break from taking care of the kids, my husband says, Maya, you must be exhausted. Do you want to go out by yourself for a while? I'll take care of the kids. Thank you, Andrew. But how about we all go out together? It's such a beautiful day today. A kind husband and beloved children. The days of happiness feel like a lie compared to the cancelled wedding day five years ago. I remarried a young and beautiful woman, unlike you. Shane, my ex-husband, said to me with a vulgar smile on his face. Getting remarried just a week after our divorce. He was probably cheating on me even when we were married. Shane and I used to be a loving couple for a while after we got married. Since we both liked children, we had been thinking about having kids from the beginning of our marriage. I hope we can have kids soon. I want a boy and a girl, one of each. Ideally, the first one would be a girl and the second a boy. Shane spoke happily about our future. However, we couldn't have children despite our efforts. As time went on, our relationship deteriorated and we ended up hating each other and getting divorced. One week later, while visiting the mall to take my mind off things, I ran into Shane. My name is Hillary. I'm in my 30s and work at a company. I met my husband, who is four years older than me, through a friend, and we got married three years ago. My husband's name is Shane. Shane and I both love children so we had been thinking about having kids from the start of our marriage. I hope we can have kids soon. I want a boy and a girl, one of each. Ideally, the first one would be a girl and the second a boy. Yes, that's right. As long as they're healthy, I don't really care about the gender, but I'd like to have more than one. We exchanged these conversations with smiles, imagining what our children would look like and what their personalities would be. However, even after one year, two years of marriage, we couldn't have children. In the first year, he said, It didn't work again, huh? Well, we don't need to rush. They say it's a gift from heaven. But from the second year onwards, he started to get angry. What, it didn't work again? My coworker got married and had a baby within two months. Why can't we have one? Even if you say that to me. Around this time, our relationship started to worsen. Shane's attitude became harsh and I couldn't bear it alone, so I often confided in my best friend, Aurora. Aurora always listened to me seriously. I see. He really wants kids, so I understand why he gets disappointed, but I wish he'd be more considerate of you, Hillary. She said sympathetically. That's right. It's like he's become a different person. He used to be so kind. Remembering the old Shane, I sighed deeply. Aurora also shared her worries with me, and we confided in each other about things we couldn't easily tell others. Even after that, we couldn't have children, and before I knew it, three years had passed since we got married. I thought it was impossible to get pregnant naturally, so one day I suggested infertility treatment to Shane. After finishing dinner, I spoke to him, who was drinking coffee. Hey Shane. We haven't had kids in three years, right? I'm already 34, so how about we try infertility treatment? At my words, he made a blatantly annoyed face. What? Infertility treatment? Isn't it because you're just getting old? If you want to do it, do it by yourself. Why would you say that? I was stunned by his unexpectedly harsh response and was at a loss for words. I'm not doing it. There's no way the problem is with me. Shane spat out those words and quickly left for the bedroom. I was left standing there in shock. Is he not willing to cooperate at all? I quietly murmured, 
feeling a mix of emptiness and sadness. Reluctantly, I decided to go to the fertility clinic alone for the time being. After undergoing the initial tests by myself, where is your husband? He needs to cooperate too. Many cases of infertility are due to male factors. Next time, bring him along. The doctor asked. Taking the doctor's words to heart, I decided to discuss the issue with him again that night. Hey, infertility treatment won't work if it's just me. You need to get tested too, so can you come to the clinic with me? What? You think it's my fault? It's obviously your problem, not mine. I'm not involved. I told you to handle it on your own. Don't drag me into this. He shouted angrily. But it seems that male infertility is also common. What? The doctor said so, and he insisted that husbands need to cooperate too. Please, Shane, come to the clinic with me. I pleaded desperately with him. Reluctantly, with an annoyed look on his face. Fine. Stop nagging. He finally said. A few days later, I took Shane to the fertility clinic. Shane underwent the tests, but when he came out of the examination room, he looked irritated and upset. We waited in the waiting room to hear the results of my previous tests and Shane's recent ones. However, the clinic was crowded and we weren't called for a while. Shane, unable to wait any longer, stood up from his seat and said, I'm leaving. Ignoring my attempts to stop him, he left the clinic alone. Reluctantly, I decided to hear the results by myself. Finally, I was called in and listened to the doctor's findings, which shocked me. I have to tell him. I hurried home. Opening the door, I said, I'm home. And then washed my hands before heading to the living room. There stood Shane, looking furious, his face contorted like a demon. What's going on? Hey! This is ridiculous! I thought fertility tests would be easier. Why did I have to go through such humiliation? Apparently, he was unhappy with the methods used in the male infertility test. Well, we need to do proper tests to find out why we can't have a baby. So, um, about the test results. Before I could finish, he interrupted me, yelling. You're an old woman, that's why we can't have kids, and I had to go through that. I can't take it anymore. I want a divorce. What? What are you talking about all of a sudden? Shane's sudden declaration of divorce left me stunned. I can't live with an infertile old woman anymore. What? After enduring Shane's insults and the way he blamed me for being infertile, my feelings for him turned ice cold in that moment. Fine. Let's get a divorce. Good, I'm glad you're agreeing so quickly. Get out, infertile old woman. I packed my things in silence and left the house. I decided to stay at my parents' place for the time being. My parents welcomed me warmly, which I appreciated deeply. As soon as I arrived at my parents' house, I filled out my portion of the divorce papers and sent them to him. Three years of marriage with Shane. In the beginning, he was kind and a good husband. We had many happy memories together. But the Shane I loved is no more. When I recall his ugly face, calling me an infertile old woman and demanding a divorce, I feel a deep sadness and a surge of intense anger. I no longer had even a shred of affection left for him. A week later, I went to a large shopping mall to clear my mind. As I wandered through the bustling corridors, I spotted a familiar profile in the distance and couldn't help but mutter. Oh, great just my luck. I quickly turned on my heel, hoping to leave unnoticed. Hillary, is that you? Unfortunately, Shane had already spotted me and called out. I ignored him and kept walking. Hey, wait up! 
but he grabbed my arm. Let go of me. I shook off his hand, but Shane just looked at me with that irritating smirk of his. Have you been following me? Still not over me, huh? What? His absurd accusation left me speechless. Well, I've remarried a beautiful, young woman. There's no place for an infertile old woman like you. So why don't you just disappear? He laughed crudely, looking down on me. Even though he had just stopped me to talk, now he was telling me to go away. The nerve. We had only been divorced for a week, and he was already remarried? It hit me then, Shane had been cheating on me. Our marriage had deteriorated not only because we couldn't have children but also because he had been unfaithful. He must have been so eager to get divorced because he had someone else lined up. What a despicable man. As I frowned, I heard a sugary voice. Shane, who are you talking to? The voice belonged to a woman with blonde hair, heavy makeup, and revealing clothes. She was carrying branded bags and accessories, clearly flaunting her wealth. Oh, you're done shopping? This is my ex-wife. Oh, the infamous ex-wife. She looked at me with disdain. I recognized her from somewhere. Who was she? I almost remembered, but the memory eluded me. Seeing my confusion, Shane smugly introduced her. Hillary, meet my wife, Mary. Isn't she beautiful and young? Hi there, I'm Shane's Mary. I'm 25. At that moment, I couldn't hold back my laughter. I see, that Mary. I finally remembered who she was. I laughed so hard that tears came to my eyes, leaving Mary and Shane baffled. Between fits of laughter, I managed to say to Shane, My condolences. Anyway, I'm busy, so I'll be going now. As I tried to leave, Shane hurriedly stopped me. Hey, wait. What do you mean, my condolences? Is that your way of trying to cope? Coping? Not at all. Then what? Explain yourself. Shane demanded, clearly irritated. Fine, I'll tell you. I turned to Mary. I know who you are. I said. What? I don't know any dull, frumpy old woman like you. Mary responded with a puzzled look. Calling me a dull, frumpy old woman, how rude. In a cold voice, I asked her. Do you know a woman named Aurora? Aurora? Oh. She seemed to remember. Her face turned pale. Aurora. Isn't she Hillary's friend? What does Mary have to do with Aurora? Shane asked anxiously. I answered. She was a hostess who deceived Aurora's boyfriend and bled him dry. The moment he ran out of money, she tossed him aside like trash. What? His eyes widened in disbelief. So, I had heard from Aurora that her boyfriend had been deceived and manipulated by a hostess named Mary who had made him spend lavishly on her. The club had initially explained it was all part of the job, but he genuinely believed they were in love and bought her expensive bags and branded watches at her request. Aurora, not wanting a man who could be fooled by a hostess, decisively broke up with him and has since moved on completely. The picture she showed me then was of this woman, Mary. At first, I thought it was just her boyfriend being naive, but Mary had gone as far as having a physical relationship outside the club, checking out houses to live in after marriage, and using elaborate methods to keep her boyfriend hooked. Moreover, she did this with multiple men, which was shocking. Mary wasn't just toying with her boyfriend, she was doing this to several men. Wasn't it a top executive at a trading company? an officer at a small construction firm, and a manager at the state office. Oh, but she cut ties with them once they stopped spending money. Aren't you being tricked too? That's a lie. There's no way that's true. 
You're just making things up because you're jealous, aren't you? Don't mess with me. Shane was furious and refused to listen to my warning. That's right. There's no way I'd do something like that. I don't even know who Aurora is, and I haven't made anyone spend money on me. Everything you're saying is a lie. Old woman, you're just jealous because I'm beautiful, aren't you? Mary also blatantly lied and shouted back at me. Mary's right, you're just jealous of her and making up stories. You're a barren old woman and ugly. Barren old woman is hilarious, so pathetic. Get lost, old woman. Taking advantage of my silence, they both hurled insults at me. Feeling it was ridiculous, I said. All right, fine. Don't believe me then. I really don't care about you anymore. Be happy. And left the scene. Behind me, I could hear his anxious voice. It's really a lie, right? Mary isn't tricking me, right? And Mary's. Of course it's a lie. Believe me. I told you everything that old woman said was a lie. That's what I heard. A few days later, I met Aurora and told her about what had happened. What? That Mary remarried Shane. I was already shocked when I heard you divorced Shane, but for him to remarry that woman. She was visibly shocked, her eyes and mouth wide open. Yes, I was really surprised too. It's such a small world. It really is. But Shane, he's in for a rough time. Knowing how Shane had treated me, Aurora smiled slightly, as if she found it amusing. Yes, I think Shane is going to go through hell. Although it seems he's completely infatuated with her right now. We laughed together, feeling somewhat satisfied. One day. After work, I was heading home as usual. Suddenly, from behind. Hillary. A weak voice called out startling me so much I almost jumped. When I turned around, it was Shane standing there. What do you want? Don't scare me like that. What are you doing here? Can you lend me some money? What? Shane was much thinner than when I last saw him. In fact, he was gaunt, with sunken cheeks. His eyes were hollow, and his clothes were worn out, looking very shabby. When I saw Shane and heard him ask for money, I could already guess what had happened. You look like Mary completely wrecked you, inside and out. Yeah, that's exactly it. You were right. She used me for every penny I had, and the moment my savings ran dry, she just up and left me. Just as I had warned him, she just married him for his money, used him until he was broke then left divorce papers and walked out on him. How foolish. I warned you clearly. Oh, I should have listened to you, Hillary. Do you know how much I spent on her? She's such a terrible woman. Don't you feel sorry for me? I was tricked, I'm the victim here. Ha. To call himself a victim, it's just too much. He brought this all upon himself. She took everything from me, and now I can't even pay my rent this month. Of course, I can't pay the utility bills either. Hey, I'm really sorry, but could you lend me some money to live on for now? If not, I'll end up homeless. I was astonished at how easily Shane could ask for such a favor. And also, I want to get back together with you. Please. Take me back. Mary tricked me and took everything, and now I realize how wonderful you are. Let's get married again. I'm begging you. Marry me again. I looked at Shane, clinging to me and crying, with cold eyes. Sorry to burst your bubble, but I refuse. What? Why? Why? Have you forgotten what you did to me? I don't love you anymore, not even a tiny bit. 
I hate you so much I don't even want to see your face. There's no way I'll ever get back together with you. As I stated this clearly, Shane's face turned bright red with anger. Who do you think you are talking to me like that? I'm offering to get back together with a barren woman like you. You should be grateful. I couldn't help but laugh at his words. Why are you laughing? Well, I was just wondering how long you'd keep misunderstanding things. Misunderstanding? I confronted him directly. The infertility issue isn't mine, it's yours. What? Shane was speechless. Remember the test results from the hospital? You didn't stay to hear them. I was going to tell you that night, but you were too busy shouting about divorce to listen to me. Yes, the hospital tests showed that Shane's ability to father a child was nearly zero, making natural conception impossible. On the other hand, I had no issues. Lies. That's a lie. There's no way I could be infertile. Stop making things up. Refusing to believe me, he yelled. I take pride in never having been sick. There's no way I could be infertile. It's definitely you. If you don't believe me, go to the hospital and check for yourself. I calmly told him. Ugh. Is it really true? No, it can't be. There's no way I'll never have children. Shane was visibly shaken, sweating profusely. Up until now, he never even considered he could be the problem. That's why you should go and hear it directly from the doctor. If you ever plan to marry someone else, you should know your own body well. With that, I left the scene. Later, Shane did go to the fertility clinic and heard the results. Here, it was finally made clear to him that he was the one responsible for our infertility, and he finally believed it. He called me many times, but I ignored all of them. Then, he started leaving voicemail messages. Hey, it was my fault. I'm really sorry. Please give me another chance. Answer the phone. I'm begging you. I have no money. The debt is getting out of hand. Hillary, please help me. He left many such messages and I got so fed up that I deleted them all and blocked Shane. A few days after blocking him, Shane ambushed me outside my workplace. Hillary! Please! I don't need us to get back together, but just lend me some money. I'm not asking for much. $10,000, no, even $5,000 would be fine. I'm begging you. We were married, right? Shane pleaded with deep regret. Stop it. Not here. I'm not giving you a single cent. Go away. I'll call the police. Even though I warned him, Shane continued pleading. Lend me the money. He wouldn't budge, so I actually called the police to handle the situation. Shane was apparently so shocked by being confronted by the police or perhaps afraid of increased police patrols, that he didn't appear in front of me again. Shane continued to pile up debt due to his financial struggles. Moving into a rundown apartment and taking a part-time job at a convenience store at night to make ends meet. But the strain took its toll and he started making frequent mistakes at his main job. He was seen as a burden by everyone doing poorly at his primary job while also juggling a side job, and he was feeling quite uncomfortable about it. Meanwhile, I had almost completely recovered from the shock of the divorce and was working energetically every day. I had relied heavily on my parents, but now I moved into an apartment near my office and was enjoying a leisurely single life. Recently, on a trip that Aurora and I had been planning for a long time, I started dating a man named Tarek whom I met during the trip. It was a long-distance relationship, but last month, he was transferred to a branch near my house. He asked me, Would you marry me? So, 
It looks like things are going to get busy from now on. Those bags are for you and dad to take. Get out of here, will you? I couldn't hide my shock at the sight of the bags piled up at the front door. Everything in them belonged to me and my husband, from clothes to daily necessities. What's going on? Why are you kicking us out of our own home? My hands trembled with anger at the sheer injustice. Seeing my reaction, my son and daughter-in-law smirked. We're taking over this house before dad gets back from his business trip. Consider it our wedding gift. That's absurd. You can't do that. Well, you didn't give us any wedding money, so it's only fair. You're old anyway, why don't you go to a nursing home or something? Mia said, and Alex burst into laughter. Great idea. Off to the nursing home with you. They both jeered at the idea of sending us to a nursing home. I found the situation so ridiculous that I burst into laughter. They looked at me suspiciously, but I didn't care. Are you sure you won't regret this? Regret? We'll feel relieved. All right then, suit yourselves. I smiled at the bluffing Alex and Mia, grabbed my bags, and left the house. Ah, it feels so good without the nuisances. We got the house, too. This is awesome. I heard their jubilant voices from the other side of the front door. They have no idea what's coming for them. I dragged my carry-on bag away from the scene. My name is Laura. I've worked in caregiving for many years and retired at 70. I enjoy interacting with people, so even after retirement, I volunteer locally. My husband is also in his 70s and runs a small to medium-sized business. He's quite active for his age, often accompanying his employees on business trips. It seems that the company will be handed over when the successor grows up, so I would like to support husband's work until then. We have a son named Alex. He was a miracle baby for us, as we struggled with infertility for years. We raised him with love and care, and he used to be a well-behaved child. Alex had always been a good kid, the kind of son that made parents proud and neighbors talk. It's not like we spoiled him. We taught him the basics, what's wrong is wrong, and don't do things that annoy others. But when Alex hit high school, we realized there's only so much parents can do. He started hanging out with a local group of troubled teens, and his life began to spiral. The influence of friends can be greater than that of parents. Our once honest and straightforward son became rebellious, selfish, and self-centered. He barely graduated high school and went on to a local college, where he started demanding to live alone. We rented an apartment for him and supported his tuition and living expenses. We hoped college would give him a sense of urgency and a stepping stone to independence, but Alex barely attended classes and remained aimless even after barely graduating. Now, Alex is in his mid-40s. No job, no significant other. Is he going to be all right? These were my worries when I called him about coming home for the holidays. That's when everything started to unravel. Hello, who is this? The voice I heard after six months was clearly not Alex's. A woman's voice, cute but somewhat languid. Um, is this Alex's phone? Who are you? Who are you? I heard Alex's voice faintly in the background. Mia, who are you talking to? Alex, some unknown lady is calling. I don't know any older women. Who is it? Alex, now laughing, took the phone and his voice turned noticeably annoyed when he realized it was his mom. What do you want, mom? Why? You haven't shown your face in years. How about coming home for the holidays? Your dad misses you. In fact, my husband was really missing him. Probably more than me, he's always concerned about Alex's future and well-being. Maybe it's because they used to fight a lot during his teenage years. 
but Alex's response was cold. Nah, coming home is a hassle. I'm staying here with Mia. At least call your dad. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So, the girl earlier, Mia? Are you dating her? Living together? I couldn't help but ask about the woman I had just spoken to. Would a girlfriend really answer her boyfriend's phone without permission? Would she rudely address a stranger as you and speak without any courtesy? Honestly, it was pretty outrageous. But instead of answering, Alex just clicked his tongue in annoyance. Ugh, so annoying. What did you say? You guys are always so annoying, always meddling in my business. Without a shout, he hung up the phone. I'd been yelled at during Alex's rebellious years, but I never thought he'd speak to me like that as an adult. I stood there, phone in hand, stunned. I'm home. Did you talk to Alex? That night, I told my husband about the rude woman who answered the phone and the harsh words from Alex. My husband looked serious but eventually said, Well, he's working, even if it's temporary employment. Let's give him some space. Maybe my husband was right. I was shocked when Alex changed in high school, influenced by his surroundings. I've been anxious that he might be hanging out with the wrong crowd or dating someone questionable. Maybe my over-involvement was getting to him. I decided to consciously hold back on reaching out. A few months later, Alex contacted us. He said he'd found a decent job back home and would be returning soon. Despite everything, my husband and I were relieved. It's unsettling when your child is far away and comforting when they return. But when Alex came home, he brought an unfamiliar woman with him. This is Mia. We're getting married. My husband and I couldn't hide our surprise at the sudden marriage announcement. Especially since Alex was still a temporary worker. And Mia apparently wasn't working steadily either. Could they really get by without stable income? Welcome, Mia. Wow, Alex's family home is so old-fashioned. Is the floor going to collapse? How long have you two been dating? I don't remember. Are you the type to worry about the details, old man? Mia's answers to our questions were dismissive. Alex didn't correct her, he just laughed along. My husband and I exchanged a glance and shrugged in disappointment. This is bad. My husband's words sounded like he was pitying them. Despite our objections, Alex and Mia went ahead and registered their marriage. When we said we wanted to meet Mia's parents, she told us it wasn't necessary, denying us even a meeting of both families. Moreover, upon moving back to their hometown, Alex and Mia started living in a brand new apartment. It's so different from the rundown place we were living in before. Alex said, clearly pleased. But with their unstable income, there's no way they could afford the rent for such a nice, new place. Sure enough, they started relying on our money. We decided to help with the rent, thinking they'd have expenses as newlyweds. But they also started coming over more often to eat, perhaps to save on groceries. Yet Mia's attitude remained the same. What's with this side dish? It looks disgusting. It's always been like this. Lacks color or something, Alex chimed in. I was getting irritated. If you don't like it, you don't have to eat it. You're the ones who keep showing up. I'm just cooking extra for you. Mia seemed unfazed and didn't take my words to heart. Influenced by her, Alex became increasingly rude to me and my husband, making us dread interacting with them. Then, suddenly, my husband had to go on a business trip. He had to spend several weeks in another region with a potential successor for the company. During that time, I'd have to deal with Alex and Mia alone. I'm really sorry to leave you alone at a time like this. It's fine. 
you're about to retire from being the boss anyway. And look, we have something to look forward to. True. It's just a matter of enduring until that's completed. Don't let those two get to you too much. We encouraged each other, and a few days later, I saw my husband off. After that, for some reason, Alex and Mia stopped coming over, and a brief period of peace was ensued. I was busy with my re-entry volunteer activities, so it was good not to have to deal with them. But one day, I came home to find Alex rummaging through my dresser, where I keep my banking cards. What are you doing? I turned on the lights and shouted. Alex tossed the banking card he was holding. Bad timing. You shouldn't have come back. Do you even realize what you're doing? We're family, so give me some money. We didn't even get a wedding gift from you. Alex lamented not receiving a wedding gift, but that's to be expected. After all, my husband and I still haven't accepted his marriage to Mia. We're already helping with their rent and providing meals. And now he's trying to steal his own parents' banking card? Unbelievable. I immediately kicked Alex out. I don't remember raising a child who would steal money from his parents. If you ever do this again, we're done. I hurled these strong words at him, and he left, clicking his tongue. I immediately called my husband to tell him what had happened. Even though we're family, the fact that Alex was trying to forcibly take money alarmed my husband. That Alex would do something like this. I warned him we'd cut ties if he does it again, but there's no guarantee he won't. Let's move the banking cards to a different location for now. I'll be back in a few days, and we can have a proper discussion then. All right, I'll be waiting. Only a few more days until my husband returns. I hid our valuables and braced myself for any surprise visits from Alex and Mia. But I never expected them to resort to such drastic measures. One day, when I returned from my re-entry volunteer activities, I found a truck parked in front of our house. Boxes and furniture were being carried in by movers. I rushed inside and found Alex and Mia. What are you doing? Ah, uh, Mom. Sorry, but we've decided to take this house. Owning a home is an asset, right? So, it's better if we live here instead of you old folks. Mia said, laughing. I was too confused to comprehend what they were saying. Besides, Dad's still working at 70, right? Even now, he's on a business trip. I don't want to end up like that. Working hard is for suckers. While you guys are still healthy, we're taking what we can. Remarks that make a fool of her husband. Alex's words were a mockery of my husband, who has worked hard as a small and medium-sized business owner. I understand that it's been tough getting the business off the ground, but to me, this felt like an unbearable insult. Those are your belongings. Get out. Alex pointed to several bags packed at the entrance. I couldn't hide my shock. Everything from our clothes to daily necessities had been shoved into bags. Why should we have to leave the house we live in for you too? Faced with such unjust treatment, my hands trembled with anger. Seeing my reaction, the couple grinned. We're going to make this house ours before dad gets back from his trip. Consider it a wedding gift. That's impossible. You didn't give us a wedding gift, so this is only fair. You're old, why don't you go to a facility or something? When Mia said that, Alex joined in with a big laugh. That's a great idea. Old folks should go to a facility, a facility. As they chanted, urging me to go to a facility, something in me snapped. And I burst into laughter. The two of them looked at me suspiciously, but I didn't care. Are you sure about this? You won't regret kicking me out. Huh? We'll feel refreshed. All right then, suit yourselves. 
I smiled at the defiant Alex and Mia, grabbed my bags, and left the house. Ah, it feels so good without the nuisance. We got the house, too. This is awesome. I could hear their jubilant voices from the other side of the front door. They have no idea what's coming their way. Dragging my carry-on bag, I left the scene. A month later, I received a call from Alex, who knew I was now living with my husband who had returned from his business trip. Hello, Alex. What's going on? Mom, it's terrible. The house. What happened to the house? Alex's voice was clearly panicked. Even without asking, I could tell something urgent was happening. Actually, I already knew why Alex was in trouble. Did you know this house is going to be demolished? Oh, did I forget to mention that? My feigned ignorance was met with Mia's voice. What the hell, M.I.L.? Did you set us up? You moved in without knowing anything. Besides, how could a house that you didn't inherit become your asset? Mia was still ranting, but I didn't care. The house they took from us was scheduled for demolition. Once my husband returned from his trip, we planned to tell Alex and move into our newly built one-story home. We had moved our banking cards to the new house the day Alex went snooping, so they were safe. I was planning to explain everything step by step, but Alex and Mia took that opportunity away from us. Listen, the contractors are already here, telling us to vacate. Where are you guys? Can you take us in for a bit? Well, you have that rental apartment, don't you? You were living there originally, so you can just go back. We thought we'd get the family home, so we already terminated the lease. I was utterly amazed at my own son's lack of crisis management skills. It seems Alex and Mia had prematurely terminated their apartment lease, thinking they could live in the family home and use the money I was paying for rent however they wanted. Only then did they find out the house was going to be demolished. But that's not our problem anymore. You guys better leave soon. If anyone other than the owner, my husband, is found living in a house scheduled for demolition, you could be charged with trespassing. Come on! We're family, help us out! You're the ones who told your parents to go to a facility, right? I did as you wished, so figure out the rest yourselves. With that, I hung up the phone without waiting for a reply. After that, the demolition began, and the house my husband and I had lived in for years disappeared without a trace. I thought the situation might turn into a police matter if Alex and Mia didn't leave by the deadline, but it seems my worries were unfounded. Life was peaceful for a while, but the calls from Alex and Mia didn't stop. We even changed our phone numbers, but they managed to track us down through local volunteer connections. Their demands were, as always, about money. Alex and Mia, without stable jobs and now without a home, were living in company housing while working at a factory. Despite having a roof over their heads, they still wanted to live luxuriously on someone else's dime. If you don't give us money, we'll show up at your house. My husband and I became a bit concerned upon hearing this desperate threat. Only a handful of people know the location of our new home. My husband had just retired as the CEO and passed the reins to his successor, but he had told some people at the company about our new residence. I don't think our employees would leak information to someone like him. Maybe we should talk to them just in case. While we were discussing this, Alex and Mia showed up at my husband's company. The current CEO informed us about their visit. Did they cause any trouble at the workplace? We were quite concerned, but the current CEO assured us that wasn't the case. The employees had heard my husband complain about Alex and Mia before, and they were appalled by their actions towards us. So, when Alex and Mia showed up at the company, they were firmly turned away. They persistently demanded to know our whereabouts, but the CEO assured us he didn't reveal anything. 
He even told them off, asking how much more unfilial they could be, and chuckled as he told us. Alex and Mia left the company in frustration and haven't returned. The CEO promised to inform us and take legal action if they try any harassment, which we gratefully accepted. He assured us that the entire company intends to protect my husband and me. It's probably the result of goodwill my husband built up while running the company. And we made a decision. We're cutting ties with Alex and Mia. Wanting money so badly that they'd inconvenience not just their parents but also those around them. Exactly. I don't even feel sad about it anymore. Parents and children are separate individuals, even if they share the same blood. There's a limit to how many times you can forgive terrible behavior. What follows is something we heard through my husband's contacts. Alex and Mia are apparently working non-stop at the factory. They've angered the factory manager by slacking off and doing a sloppy job with assembling parts. It seems they're now paying the price for their previous laziness. Perhaps because of their busy lives, Alex and Mia are constantly fighting, causing complaints from their neighbors in the company housing. Saving money is difficult for them, as their hobbies include playing the lottery and smoking, both money-draining activities. The stress of not being able to save money despite working hard and having no one to rely on must be tough. But I can't bring myself to feel sorry for them. They've never worked a proper job, which is why they could shamelessly ask for money. I hope their factory jobs will lead them to change their ways, even a little. I still get occasional calls and emails from Alex. He writes things like he's sorry for what happened and wants to get along as a family. He seems to have changed a bit, but I still can't trust him. Only when they become self-reliant and considerate can we share a life together. As long as they're preoccupied with themselves, a fresh start will be difficult. Since retiring as CEO, my husband has taken up home gardening, something he's wanted to do since he was young. I assist him with his gardening while continuing my re-entry volunteer work in our new location. I had hoped to live peacefully with our son and daughter-in-law. Ideally, I would have wanted to live peacefully with our son and his wife. That wish may not have come true, but as long as I know they're alive and well somewhere, that's enough for me. The time I spend with my husband is more precious and warm than anything else. I intend to protect this invaluable happiness and lifestyle with all my might. Mom! It had been over six months since I'd last heard from my daughter, Violet, when her call came through and it was past 8 p.m. It was rare for Violet, who had her own family, to call at such an hour unless it was daytime. I instinctively felt that something serious must have happened. Violet? What's going on, calling at this hour? What happened? At first, Violet didn't respond. All I could hear from the other end of the phone was a quiet voice, as if air was leaking out. Mom! With a thin voice, as if squeezing it out, Violet finally spoke. Violet. What's wrong? Are you really okay? Mom, help me! Realizing it was an emergency, I hit the speaker button on the phone. Immediately, my husband Matthew rushed to my side, listening intently. Violet, pull yourself together. What happened? It hurts. I haven't eaten anything. I might not make it. Haven't eaten anything? What do you mean? I haven't been given anything to eat by Florence and the others. The image of Violet crawling on the floor, desperately reaching out to me for help, flashed through my mind. That's too dangerous for you. Matthew yelled, grabbing the car keys and heading to the door. I'm coming to get you right now. I shouted through the phone, hurrying after Matthew. My name is Sierra Smith, I'm 70 years old. Currently, Matthew and I run a steakhouse together. 
Matthew, having trained in famous restaurants when he was younger, is well regarded for his skills. Matthew and I met through a relative's introduction, and he opened his own restaurant when we got married. Not only is Matthew skilled in his craft, but his adept conversation skills and unpretentious personality have won over many regular customers. It's been nearly 30 years since I started helping out at the shop, but lately, I've begun to feel my body's decline. Perhaps due to age, I've started to feel pain in my back with just a little movement. Matthew has suggested hiring part-time help, but while grateful for his concern, I worry about labor costs and choose to work while I still can. Sometimes, Matthew jokes, it would have been nice to have her around at times like this. Referring to our only daughter, Violet. Since she's already independent and has her own family, we can't ask her to come back home and help with the shop. Violet currently lives with her husband Albert, their son Kendrick, and her mother-in-law Florence in the next town over, about an hour's drive from our home. Recently, her sister-in-law Aurora joined them. I don't know the details, but I heard Aurora returned home after her divorce. I had hoped that Violet would help out at our shop after graduating from college, but Violet left home, saying she wanted to see more of the world. After that, she landed a job at a major department store, working in the ladies' clothing section. Though new to the workforce, Violet quickly won over customers with her charm and inherent cheerfulness. It was there she met her future husband, Albert Adams, who worked in the external sales department, dealing primarily with affluent clients purchasing luxury goods, and was considered a star in one of the company's most prestigious divisions. When Violet first introduced me to Albert, I felt a twinge of unease. Are you sure it's okay to marry such a perfect man? Indeed, Albert, with his handsome features and skillful conversation that appealed to women, had won over many customers, some of whom visited the store specifically to see him. Yet, Violet seemed unworried. It's okay, Mom. Don't worry. I trust him. Subsequently, Violet married Albert and upon doing so, left the department store to devote herself to supporting Albert as a housewife. The following year, the joy of having a grandson, Kendrick, allowed me to breathe a sigh of relief. It seems, despite everything, those two are doing well. For a while, the family of three lived in an apartment, but five years ago, following the death of the father-in-law, they moved to the elderly mother-in-law's house, thinking she would feel lonely by herself. Occasionally, Violet would call home, but she started to lament that Albert was often not around. Albert stayed over at a colleague's apartment again last night because work was late. It's been happening a lot recently. Even on weekends, he's away for golfing with his college. Still, Violet laughed it off over the phone, suggesting it might just be the fate of a working adult. One day, I decided to call Violet after a long time. Kendrick's birthday is coming up, right? Do you have any plans for the day? So far, we don't have anything planned for the daytime. What's up? Perfect. Our shop is closed that day, so how about the three of us go out somewhere? An amusement park or aquarium, somewhere that would make him happy. That sounds nice. Recently, Albert's been so busy with work, he hardly comes home. Kendrick has been getting bored without being able to go out. Violet sounded excited over the phone, but as Kendrick's birthday approached, she called me. I'm sorry, Mom. I hate to say this, but some plans have come up since then. We can't go out with you after all. I'm really sorry. Plans? What happened? A kids' club has organized a birthday party, so we can't make it that day. A kids' club, huh? I guess you can't just cancel on them. Though disappointed, I switched gears. Then it doesn't have to be Kendrick's birthday. Let us know whenever you're free. 
I'm sorry, Mom. It doesn't look like we'll be able to go out for a while. Next week, there's a nature class at the kids' club, and the week after that, swimming lessons start. We're just too busy. Elementary school kids these days sure have it tough. It's disappointing, but it seems like giving up is the only option. I had been looking forward to seeing my granddaughter, so my disappointment was significant. I asked some of the parents who are regulars at our restaurant about what gaming consoles are popular with kids these days and sent one to Kendrick. Mom, the gift arrived. Thank you. I received a thank you call from Violet. However, something about Violet's voice, which I should be familiar with, felt off to me. Maybe it's a mother's intuition, but Violet, usually bright and cheerful, sounded somehow dark and subdued this day. What's wrong? You sound tired today. Not at all. I'm as energetic as ever. Is that so? Well, if you say so. Anyway, thanks for the gaming console. About that. Since I'm not up to date with what elementary school kids like these days, I sent what was recommended to me. Did Kendrick really enjoy it? Of course, he did. He was really happy, saying, Grandma knows best. For some reason, Violet seemed in a hurry to end the call. As if she wanted to avoid prolonging our conversation. Are you guys doing okay? Why the sudden concern? We're managing fine. So don't worry about us, Mom. You've complained before about Albert coming home late. Has anything changed since then? You worry too much. I told you not to mind it. Forget about that. Look, phone calls aren't free, you know, so I'm going to hang up now. You must be busy with the shop, too. Just wait a minute. Right now, I'm more concerned about you than... But before I could finish, Violet had already hung up on me. Just by asking about her well-being, why does Violet seem to reject me this much? It's as if she doesn't want me to probe into her family's affairs, dodging my questions and cutting off the conversation unilaterally. I can't shake the feeling that something is not right. I felt a sense of foreboding. After the shop closes, it has become a routine for Matthew and me to have a quiet drink in the living room. That night, as usual, we relaxed, sharing the weariness of the day. It's about Violet. Something seems off. She seems tired, or maybe lacking energy. I can't quite put my finger on it. Do you call her sometimes? I just called her this afternoon but she cut me off abruptly. Is she keeping you at a distance? More like, she doesn't want to worry me. It might just be my mother's intuition, and I might be wrong, but I feel like Violet is hiding something from me. Matthew crossed his arms and fell silent for a moment before speculating. Could it possibly be related to that? To what? After hesitating, as if unsure whether to speak, Matthew seemed to make up his mind. I heard something troubling from one of our regulars about Albert. What happened with Albert? The regular mentioned seeing him coming out of a pub with a woman, not Violet. That can't be. Albert wouldn't do such a thing. The woman apparently wasn't young but was quite beautiful, dressed flamboyantly in what seemed like expensive brands. It must be a case of mistaken identity. I said this, seemingly in defense of Albert. Not so much to defend Albert, but more so because I didn't want to see a rift form between Violet and him, a sentiment more accurately described as parental concern. Of course, the regular couldn't be sure it was Albert, just someone who looked somewhat like him. I didn't want to believe this witness account at face value. Yet. I've heard that Albert has been coming home late and going out more on weekends lately. Could it be that he is seeing another woman behind Violet's back, unknown to us? 
Without any concrete information, my thoughts inevitably drift towards the worst. I'm worried about Violet. She never complains or shows weakness. If she knows about this and is suffering in silence. Don't think too negatively. I'll see what I can do. For starters, we know a lawyer among our regulars. I'm thinking of consulting him. Since then, concern for Violet has preoccupied me daily, to the point of accidentally dropping and breaking dishes. What's wrong? You seem tired yourself. I paused my work to call Violet multiple times, but she rarely answered. When she did, her updates were surprisingly brief, simply saying, I'm fine. But whenever I tried to delve deeper into family matters, she'd laugh it off and hang up quickly. Each time I heard Violet's voice over the phone, it sounded weaker, as if it might fade away at any moment. Recalling Violet's charming, beloved smile before her marriage, I felt increasingly overwhelmed by my growing anxieties, leading to tears. Then, about half a year later, I received a sudden call from Violet, who had not contacted us for some time. And it was past 8 p.m. Such calls from Violet, now with her own family, were rare at this hour unless it was daytime. I instinctively felt that something serious must have happened. Violet? What's going on, calling at this hour? What happened? Violet didn't respond. All I could hear from the other end of the phone was a quiet voice, as if air was leaking out. Despite holding the receiver, I was certain it was Violet. Is there anyone around you? Are you alone there? The lack of noisy chatter in the background led me to this conclusion. Mom! With a feeble voice, as if squeezing it out, Violet finally spoke. Violet. What's wrong? Are you really okay? Mom, help me! Sensing an emergency, I pressed the speakerphone button. Matthew quickly came to my side, listening intently. Violet, pull yourself together. Tell Mom what happened. It hurts. I haven't eaten anything. I might not make it. Haven't eaten anything? What do you mean? I haven't been given anything to eat by Florence and the others. The image of Violet crawling on the floor, desperately reaching out for my help, flashed through my mind. Violet is in danger! Matthew yelled, grabbing the car keys and heading towards the entrance. I'm coming to get you right now! I shouted through the phone, quickly following Matthew. During the drive, we were silent the entire time. Matthew kept his mouth shut, gripping the steering wheel, his brows furrowed, veins standing out on his forehead. There was an indescribable anxiety and anger at the possibility that our precious Violet was being subjected to injustice. If I looked in the mirror, I'm sure I would see the same expression on my face as on Matthew's. Holding back the tears, I closed my eyes and saw Violet's innocent, youthful smile. The image of a pure, innocent girl reaching out to Matthew and me with her tiny hands, trying to share happiness, filled me with frustration. Violet was asking for help. Thinking this made us feel incredibly ashamed for not noticing her suffering sooner. Even without seeing her directly, it was clear from her voice on the phone that Violet was severely weakened. I couldn't believe that Violet, who always had a vibrant smile, was now in such a state calling for help. Looking out the passenger window at the dark town, I thought, this must be a dream, a bad dream. Passing through a quiet residential area, the light leaking from each home seemed to carry the laughter of families, reminding me of what Violet and our life should be, which brought more sadness. The journey that usually takes an hour during the day was quicker due to the lack of rush hour traffic, and we soon arrived at the Adams house. Are you okay? If you want, I can go in alone. Matthew spoke kindly, showing concern for me, but this was a problem for our family to face. 
Preparing for whatever reality awaited us, I resolved. We will definitely save Violet with our own hands. When I rang the doorbell, a carefree voice responded after a pause. Hello? Who is it at this hour? Contrary to the urgent call from Violet, Albert's relaxed and peaceful voice left us puzzled. It's Smith! Violet's mother! Upon hearing my name, Albert fell silent, possibly on guard, then slowly asked. Um, is there something wrong? He then cracked the door open slightly, peering out at us standing outside. I'm sorry for bothering you late at night, Albert. It's urgent, and we need to talk. Matthew wedged his foot into the slight opening of the door and forcefully pushed it open. What are you doing, Matthew? We're coming in. We barged in with a determined attitude, not taking no for an answer. Standing in front of a dimly lit, narrow room at the end of the hallway. Is Violet in here? There's no explaining why we thought Violet was in this room, but we instinctively knew she was here, calling out to us for help. This is outrageous. Even if you are Violet's parents, I'll call the police. Good. That way, the police can witness this too. Without hesitation, Matthew forcefully slid open the room's door. There, Violet was curled up on the floor, resembling a worn and discarded mop. It took a few seconds for my brain to recognize that it was indeed Violet, so emaciated and altered was her appearance. Violet! Oh, what has happened to you? We rushed to Violet, lifting her weakened body in our arms. Em, Mom, help me! I'm in pain. I can't take it anymore. Barely speaking between erratic breaths, that's how Violet responded. It was immediately clear that Violet was delirious and suffering from dehydration. What are you doing here? Leave immediately. Albert tried to dismiss us as if we were intruders, but his voice lacked any conviction. His gaze wandered as if frightened, and his body trembled. Albert! Bring some water now! I can't possibly! Don't argue, just do it! Pressured by my stern shout, Albert ran to the kitchen and quickly returned with a bottle of water from the fridge. I snatched the bottle, opened it. Here, Violet. Drink some water. Alerted by the commotion, Florence and Aurora also appeared. What is all this noise about? It's so loud I can't hear the TV. We're the ones who need an explanation here. As Matthew glared at Albert, Albert began to apologize profusely. I'm so sorry. Albert then started to explain how Violet ended up in this state, a story beyond our wildest imaginations. It seemed that initially, Violet and Albert had managed well living with Florence. However, at some point, Albert started coming home late, and in response, Florence's attitude towards Violet turned cold. One day, when Violet felt anxious about Albert's late returns, she sought advice from Florence. Instead of addressing her concerns, Florence blamed Violet for Albert's absence. Violet couldn't understand why she was being blamed. It's because you haven't returned to your pre-pregnancy figure. Florence told her. Following that, Florence began imposing all household chores on Violet and even restricted her meals. Despite this, Violet remained upbeat, brushing off the unreasonable demands, but it seemed Florence found no amusement in her resilience. The harassment escalated, and under the guise of preventing secret snacking, Florence took control of all Violet's finances. Seeing an opportunity for entertainment, Aurora, the recently divorced sister-in-law, joined in, with Florence assigning her to monitor Violet whenever Florence was away. The hardest part for Violet was being denied the opportunity to care for Kendrick herself. Despite living under the same roof, there was nothing more painful and sad than not being able to raise her own child. Florence forbade Violet from seeing Kendrick and had Aurora stop her whenever she tried to approach his room. 
While Violet was punished with cleaning duties, Florence spent joyful moments with Kendrick. This is all I know. Albert said, collapsing to his knees, powerless. Don't speak of our family's shame so lightly. How could you discuss such trivial matters with strangers? Albert, you've become so weak. That's not all, is it? There's more you're hiding, right? Albert looked up, his face flashing with panic. Just then, a taxi stopped at the entrance and someone alighted. They've arrived. The Adams family was confused, unable to grasp the situation. Soon, a slender gentleman in his fifties appeared, causing Albert's face to turn pale. It seems you recognize this gentleman, don't you? Albert didn't answer, realizing he was in a situation with no escape. He waited silently, letting time pass. Good evening. My name is Kevin Watson. I believe this is the first time I've had the pleasure of meeting the Adams family in person. Kevin Watson introduced himself, looking at each member of the Adams family in turn. In his youth, Kevin Watson was a popular actor known to everyone, starring in movies and dramas. As he aged, his popularity waned, leaving only his name known to the public. Why is Mr. Kevin Watson at our home? Florence, representing the Adams family, asked, her smile strained and her voice high-pitched with clear agitation. It was clear to anyone that she was visibly shaken. It was I who invited Mr. Watson here. Before coming, I contacted a lawyer acquaintance and asked Mr. Watson to join us as well. And what exactly is the relationship between Mr. Watson and us? Florence attempted to feign ignorance, but I smirked and said, Don't pretend you don't know anything. You must have some idea why Mr. Watson is here. The lawyer arrived shortly after, apologizing for his delay. Sorry for being late. I was organizing some documents for another case, and it took longer than expected. The arrival of the lawyer silenced the Adams family. In fact, at Sierra's request, I've been investigating Albert's personal life for the past six months. It turns out, Albert has been frequently meeting a certain woman, a wealthy client at the department store where Albert works. And upon investigating this woman, we uncovered a shocking truth. That woman happens to be my wife, Hillary Sanders. Kevin Watson added in a calm tone to the lawyer's explanation. When my wife brought up divorce, I was initially surprised, but deep down, I felt, ah, of course. She had been going out secretly for a while. After hearing the details from this lawyer, everything made sense. So, we decided to come here to hear directly from Mr. Albert, the party involved. Albert slowly stood up, and in a frail voice, as if devoid of spirit, began to tell everything. My relationship with Hillary started, as mentioned earlier, through her being a major client at the department store and me being the attendant. Over the years of working visits to her home, we developed a relationship. Initially, it was just a fling for me, but then it was revealed Hillary was pregnant, and we realized we couldn't turn back. We discussed leaving our partners to remarry. I'm truly sorry. At Kevin Watson's feet, filled with indignation, Albert collapsed powerlessly. When I was a celebrated actor, adored by the public, Hillary would always greet me with her brightest smile. But now that my work has dwindled, meeting a handsome man like you must have been irresistible for her. She's the type who must have everything she likes. Kevin Watson said with a weary smile. Albert, who wanted a divorce from Violet, was in a bind because filing for divorce while having an affair would lead to a hefty compensation claim against him. So, he turned to Florence for help. Initially, 
Florence resisted the idea of divorce due to how it would look but changed her tune completely upon learning the other woman was wealthy. Thinking there would be no need to pay compensation if Violet, the daughter-in-law, initiated the divorce, Florence began to torment her relentlessly, hoping to drive her out of the house. I believed you, but you! Violet, staggering yet standing firm on her feet, expressed her frustration loudly, tears streaming down her face. I believe that if I lost weight, Albert would return to me. That's why I endured all the unreasonable demands from Florence and Aurora. To think it was all a scheme to drive me out. It's okay. You've done nothing wrong. You don't have to push yourself anymore. I embraced Violet tightly. I did want to divorce Violet, that's true. But I never imagined Mom and Aurora could be this cruel to her. I'm utterly disillusioned. Wait just a minute. I was only trying to help you by getting Violet out of this house. It's your fault for having an affair in the first place. That's right. Albert, you've been silently condoning what we've been doing. Don't act like you were oblivious to it all now. As the three of them argued, I was speechless, but Violet, trembling with anger, shouted. Enough! If you so desperately wanted me out of here, I'll leave on my own. Oh, that would be a relief. You're mistaken to be pleased, Florence. I will never forgive you. Once we're divorced, I will indeed demand a substantial amount in compensation, just so you know. With that, Violet called out with a voice that echoed through the house. Kendrick! Where are you? Come here, we're going to live with Mom and Grandpa and Grandma from now on. Okay, coming. Kendrick cheerfully ran down the stairs and hugged Violet. Subsequently, Albert, exposed for his affair with a client, was dismissed from his company for severely damaging the corporate image. Following her declaration, Violet filed for divorce and sued Albert for a significant amount in compensation. After losing his job and being ordered to pay compensation for the divorce, Albert, following a major argument with Florence and Aurora, was forced to reluctantly sell the house. Violet's anger did not subside with this, she also demanded substantial compensation from Florence and Aurora for the mental and physical distress they caused her. Despite the harassment from Florence and Aurora, Violet had meticulously documented the daily events in a notebook, which proved advantageous in court. Returning to her parents' home, Violet gradually healed both mentally and physically, reverting to her cheerful self. There were ongoing issues with the Adams family, but with the help of a skilled lawyer, everything was resolved. I heard through the grapevine that Albert and Hillary had a child. After losing his job and the house, Albert, supported by Hillary's wealth but devoid of the will to work, grew increasingly unkempt. Moreover, with the elderly Florence and the nagging Aurora joining them, Hillary, raised in luxury, could not stand it and eventually left with the child. What became of the Adams family after Hillary left is neither within my knowledge nor my interest. Well, I've slacked off enough, time to get to work. With renewed determination, Violet started helping out at the store, taking over for me as I struggled with back pain. Having worked in customer service at a major department store, Violet's reputation quickly made our shop a local sensation, drawing long lines of customers. With our new promotional model in place, I have no regrets. I stepped back from the storefront, spending my free time watching over Kendrick as much as possible. Kendrick, soon to be a middle schooler, declared at his elementary school graduation. I want to be a cool chef like Grandpa. His proclamation brought Matthew and me to tears. We are now eagerly looking forward to his future. It's unthinkable to ask for food money. Taking money from your family is shameful, you should realize that. As my son's wife shouted, glaring at my husband and me, I thought to myself that what's truly unthinkable is her behavior. 
Unthinkable indeed, you fool. People say your daughter-in-law is a stranger, and it couldn't be more true. Such a brazen woman, she's not part of my family. The one who silenced my daughter-in-law was a single remark from our beloved grandchild. I am Lily, a 65-year-old housewife. I've been married to my husband Thomas for 40 years. We have two sons, both of them have their own families now. My eldest son, Michael, lives nearby. He has an eight-year-old daughter, but we rarely see her due to her busy school schedule. However, the last person you want to see is often the one who shows up uninvited. Lily, do you have anything you don't need? I'll take it off your hands. The loud one at the front door is Michael's wife, Emma. I've disliked her ever since my son married her. Looking back, she was always a bit off. She boldly asked about my husband's salary and our savings. Emma, you shouldn't ask such things, even to family. It can upset people. I once said to her, in a lecturing tone, Eh? Why not? We're family. My parents tell me everything. Oh, by the way, they said they hardly have any savings. Seeing her laugh, I felt drained. Later, my younger son's wife said, Lily, I need to talk to you about my sister-in-law. The content was unbelievable. At that time, she was struggling to conceive and was undergoing treatment. Why don't you have kids? You should have them while you're young, it gets harder as you get older. Such meddling made her neurotic. Even when Michael scolded his wife, she showed no remorse. I was just giving advice as a mother, she defiantly claimed. But after successful treatment, a grandson was born to my younger son. Then, this time, Emma sent a message. Just because you had a boy doesn't mean he's the heir, right? My daughter is the first grandchild and the eldest son Michael's child. To the second son's wife soon after giving birth. This incident caused my younger son's family to move away, reducing our meetings to a few times a year. Children grow up watching their parents, and looking at Emma's parents, it might not be entirely false. My husband sighed deeply. Emma's parents, living in the countryside, were equally strange. Every year at Thanksgiving, we send gifts to those who've been kind to us, including Emma's parents. One year, I received a phone call from Emma's parents. Hello? I was taken aback. So, you know, the assortment of sweets and towels is fine, but we were thinking meat would be better, right? What is she talking about? It's the thought that counts, and besides, we've never received a Thanksgiving gift from Emma's parents. Yet, they had the audacity to say such things. I was hesitant, but when I told Michael about the call, he immediately scolded his wife. I should have told you what they like. Sorry. Next year, please send them their favorite things. I was stunned by her audacious response. Emma, that's not the point. We sent those gifts with love, but both my husband and I felt very offended. We never receive anything from your parents, so we'll refrain next year. We don't want to impose. I said and abruptly hung up the phone. Emma's causing friction in our family. She's odd, we should keep our distance. But contrary to my wishes, when my granddaughter Aria started elementary school, Michael's family moved close to our house. This house will be well taken care of by our family. Lily, you and your husband can comfortably move into a home for the elderly. When she said this with a smile, both my husband and I were speechless. In essence, she meant they wouldn't care for us but would take the house. We didn't expect care from them, especially not from Emma. But living nearby meant we'd frequent use the same supermarket. When I go shopping, there's an 80% chance I run into Emma. Oh? Lily, are you shopping too? What a coincidence, so am I. Emma says this, but I'm not a fool either. She must have seen me leaving our apartment for the supermarket. And her goal was clear, just one thing. These, I saw on TV. They were delicious. This is also recommended. And this too. She would unceremoniously add items to my shopping cart. I live with just my husband, we can't eat all of these. Even I put things back, 
she'd quickly return them to my cart, saying. It's fine, I'll take them, don't worry about it. Fine for what? I thought, but with neighbors and friends working at the supermarket, I couldn't raise my voice. After I paid, she brazenly opened the packages as if they were her share and stuffed them into plastic bags, then into her own shopping bags. Even with a 10-pack of eggs, she'd say. You can't eat all these, right? I'll take some. And open the pack herself. That finally made me angry. I use eggs every day, it's okay. Please give them back. And this meat too, I'll freeze any leftovers. When I said this, Michael and Aria both love eggs. I want them to eat a lot. And meat too. But, you know, Michael's salary has been cut recently. She showed a visibly downcast appearance. Looking at her shopping bag, it was mostly discounted items. Because of her loud voice, other shoppers looked at us strangely. On a day I didn't encounter her at the supermarket, a neighbor working there stopped me to say, Can't you do something about your son's wife? Asking for more discounts, not listening when we say we don't put sale stickers on items in the cart. Her embarrassing behavior made me feel like my face was on fire. Give me a break. My head's going to explode. Most of my conversations with my eldest son Michael became about his wife. That weekend, Michael and his unusually serious-faced wife Emma came over. As soon as she entered the room, Lily, I got too comfortable thinking we're family. I'm sorry for the trouble at the supermarket. I'll refrain from such embarrassing behavior from now on. Is this really the same woman? She seemed genuinely remorseful. I later learned from my son that they had a serious fight. He threatened divorce if there wasn't an improvement, which seemingly changed her attitude. Life was peaceful for a while. But people don't change that easily. After that, I felt awkward using the supermarket, so I started ordering groceries online. Then, my son's wife began bringing my granddaughter Aria to visit regularly. Grandma, I drew this. She showed us a well-drawn picture. Oh my. Aria, your colored pencils are quite short. I remarked. I want to buy her new pencils, but things are tough. Sorry, Aria. Emma interjected. Seeing this, my husband took out his wallet. Here, buy Aria some new pencils with this. And gave her a small amount of money. She continued visiting, saying Aria's shoes were too small or she needed new clothes, always appealing to us. Sometimes she'd boldly enter our kitchen and ask, do you have anything you don't need? Hey, is Michael's company really struggling that much? And if life is so hard, why doesn't Emma work? She's been a housewife since marriage, at home during the day. My daughter-in-law, Emma, has been a housewife ever since she got married and seemed to be at home during the day. If she could use that time for part-time, her life would be a little easier. My husband and I often discussed this. That's the point. Then, out of the blue, my eldest son's family came over. We're thinking of moving in here. A completely unexpected proposition, my husband and I exchanged glances. Sorry to spring this on you, Dad, Mom. Emma suddenly started insisting on living together. See, you got your way. Let's go home. My son tried to take her home, but she stubbornly refused, and it was getting nowhere. My husband, having had enough, said, If you're that insistent, we won't ask for rent. But you'll have to split the food costs with us. We're living on a pension, after all. Then, she stopped in her tracks. It's unthinkable to ask for food money. Taking money from your family is shameful, you should realize that. She came back with an outrageous response. Aren't you the one who should be embarrassed? And then, If that's how you feel, then we are done as of today. And of course, I'll never let you see Arya again. I watched her fury in silence. Thinking back, ever since she came into our lives, I've never had a day of peace. I've tolerated her because she's my eldest son's choice, but now I've reached my limit. 
I'll only cut ties with her alone and secretly ask Michael to let us meet our granddaughter. When I was thinking this, Hey, what does disowning mean? Like, not seeing each other anymore? If that's the case, I want to disown mom. Everyone was shocked by my granddaughter Aria's words. Eh? Aria, what are you saying? Especially Emma, who looked astonished. Because, mom, do you know what my friends call you? The beggar. Sometimes they laugh at me, and I don't want to go to school. The one who's embarrassing is you. Aria's face looked like she was about to cry. Apparently, Emma had been making begging attacks on the parents of Aria's friends too. Besides, you buy things you like, but my clothes and shoes are old. You said you'd buy me new colored pencils, but you never do. Hearing this, I asked. Eh? What do you mean? We gave you money to buy Aria colored pencils, didn't we? I can't believe it, but did you use it for yourself? My eldest son's wife made an uncomfortable face and replied. No. I used it for living expenses. It's hard to get by on just Michael's salary. My son immediately said. What money? And you always say that, so I've been working hard. I've been promoted twice since we got married. How much do you need to be satisfied? Or is this about divorce? I told you, if you cause any more trouble for my family or others, there won't be a next time. Above all, you've hurt Arya. You're a failure as a mom. With his cold words, Emma's eyes filled with tears. But I can't help it. We were poor growing up, I couldn't have what I wanted. Now I'm an adult, I want to eat and buy what I like. What's wrong with that? To her crying hysterically, I said. Don't be ridiculous. Making your child suffer while satisfying your own desires is just an excuse. I have no blood relation to you, and I would have welcomed a good daughter-in-law, but honestly, I only care about Michael and Arya. A foolish woman like you, I disown you. And with that, she was taken back home by Michael. She probably thought living in our house would save on living expenses. What a joke. We decided to take care of our granddaughter Arya for a while. Because Emma had said. You're an ungrateful child for repaying kindness with ingratitude. To her daughter. Thinking she is doing her child a favor just shows she is finished as a mom. Emma insisted on not divorcing, but my son ignored her and forcibly sent her back to her parents' home. Of course, we got many calls from her ridiculous parents, but we ignored them all. The divorce wasn't easy and went to mediation. But thankfully, my son got custody. That's because her arguments were terrible, all about wanting to stay a housewife and not wanting to divorce, with no thought for Aurea. Also, my son hadn't told us, but he had been living a repressed life, documented in his diaries. It was also discovered that Emma had been secretly saving a lot of money in her own bank account, which worked in my son's favor regarding the distribution of property. Honestly, I didn't want to give that woman a cent. My son Michael and granddaughter Aria moved out of their apartment to live with us. Aria, I'm so sorry for making you feel lonely with all my work. I'm really happy you want to live with me. My son was crying with happiness. Aria looked a bit shy. I thought peaceful days were finally here, but then, a few months later, some unwelcome visitor started ringing our doorbell incessantly while my son was at work and my granddaughter at school. What? Looking at the monitor, I saw an unexpected figure. What do you want? Everything's been settled, right? Opening the door, there stood Emma, my former daughter-in-law, and her parents, faces filled with anger. Settled? Don't be ridiculous. Why haven't you paid child support? Emma's mom's words confused us. Excuse me? We're raising Aria here. If Emma were to pay, maybe, but why should we? My husband glared at the three of them, baffled. Then Emma's dad said. Emma has no income after the divorce. For the time being, your son should be taking care of her. That's why he needs to pay child support for Emma. 
Behind her parents, my ex-daughter-in-law looked at me triumphantly. We couldn't help but laugh at such ridiculous statements. Um, you might want to look up what child support means. How old is your daughter? All I see is a healthy adult woman over 30. Did you really pay travel expenses just to come here and say something so foolish? Following me, my husband added. What you're doing is extortion. Now that we're divorced, we're strangers. We won't hesitate to call the police next time. To be honest, I've never once considered you family. He then pulled out his mobile phone. Seeing this, they panicked. Police? That's ridiculous. We're leaving. And they left hastily, almost fleeing. Watching them go, we mused. Those parents seemed normal until the marriage, but you really can't understand people. Child support for a wife? Never heard of such a thing. That woman, crazy till the end. We laughed for a while, remembering their foolish faces. Apparently, Emma's family was struggling financially. Unbeknownst to us, they had been recipients of TANF for years, receiving it under the pretense of the dad's mental illness. However, it was revealed as fraud following an anonymous tip. They were all healthy, they should have been working. It's infuriating to think such people were getting money meant for those truly in need. They were working and paying fines for a while, but people don't change easily. They were arrested for theft a few months later. They're strangers now, but I hope they continue to struggle. As for us, we've been living peacefully as if it was all a lie. Arya has brightened up and brings friends home more often. Furthermore, my younger son's family decided to move back here for his job transfer. I've been in touch with my daughter-in-law. Lily, please teach me cooking again. My son is thrilled that he'll get to see everyone more. And he's so excited to play with his cousin Arya after we move. Looking back, I saw the grandchildren playing happily together, a smile naturally forming on my face. Then, three years after the divorce, my son Michael remarried. Her name is Elizabeth, introduced by a friend. She was mistreated by her ex-husband and his family for not being able to have children. Elizabeth is kind and gentle, getting along well with my younger son's wife. Above all, I miss my grandchild Arya very much and we prepare meals together. Arya shyly called me mom for the first time the other day. I thought I would never be able to be mom, so I was so happy. Elizabeth teared up as she told me. I gently patted her back. I'm truly happy that someone as kind-hearted as you became Michael's wife and Aria's mom. Thank you, Elizabeth. Soon, my son's family will move to a new home. Not too far from here. Michael and Aria had a hard time with his ex-wife, but with Elizabeth, they'll surely have peaceful days. My husband and I are planning to start a small garden when we're alone. It seems we'll be able to spend our old age in peace. Thinking about this, I savored our current happiness. Happy birthday! Make sure you eat it all! What was presented in front of me was a surprise birthday cake made by my mother-in-law, Kyla. It was extravagantly topped with whipped cream, so that the strawberries were buried under a mountain of it. The moment I saw it, I caught my breath. I've mentioned I'm allergic to dairy, haven't I? Oh, did you? It's fine. Your body will get used to it if you eat it. It's life-threatening for me. Haven't you been intentionally using allergens in your cooking? Stop complaining. Be grateful for what I've prepared. Kyla had always found reasons to summon my husband Alan and me to her house, eager to feed us her home cooking. However, the dishes she prepared were invariably made with dairy products, which I couldn't consume. Unable to eat much, I sipped tea while Kyla and Alan dined merrily, a situation that left me feeling frustrated. Yet, I endured without a frown. However, it was my birthday party she hosted that would lead to Kyla's misfortune. I'm Tiana, 30 years old. After dating for two years, Alan and I got married this summer. We had lived together for a year before our marriage, so life as newlyweds was not much different than before. But one thing had been bothering me since we started dating Kyla's presence. 
She doted on her son Alan and seemed to want to be near him at all times. She frequently barged into our apartment where we lived together. If the relationship were good, it might have been natural to accept her, but our relationship was far from amicable. She always focused on Alan, interrupting my words and enjoying conversations with her son. Having never interacted with the parents of anyone I dated before, I questioned her behavior, thinking it was just how things were. But there were things that struck me as odd. Tiana, let's go to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park for the long weekend next month. That sounds great. The foliage should be beautiful, and it's been a while since we last visited. That sounds fun. I want to come too. Then let's go, the three of us. Mom and us. Tiana, that's okay with you, right? Yeah, sure. Tiana, you're so kind. We need to pull it down on the calendar as soon as we get home. In this way, the intrusive Kyla would try to tag along on our trips. She suggested numerous hotels to stay at, and before I knew it, she and Alan were making plans together. Once the plan was set, Tiana, could you handle the bookings? She'd say, leaving the rest of the arrangements to me. And when it was time to depart for the trip, she wouldn't even take out her wallet for anything, from the travel expenses to meals and even souvenirs. At that time, Alan and I weren't officially married yet. Can we split the cost? I'd do the same for your parents if they needed anything. When he said that, I couldn't object strongly, so I had no choice but to agree and pay. Despite the frustrations with Kyla, Alan was always kind to me, and we spent peaceful times together when it was just the two of us. So, when he proposed, I happily decided to marry him. However, even after our marriage, Kyla's behavior was something I couldn't ignore. On our days off, as we relaxed at home, Alan's mobile phone would ring. Oh, mom. It's you. Did you make too much food again? Okay, I'll ask Tiana. Putting the call on hold, Alan would ask me. Mom's made too much for dinner, she's asking if we want to come. That's okay, right? Again? We just went through the same routine three days ago, visiting Kyla's house. And we've already been over there eight times this month. Come on. It'll save you the trouble of cooking. I'll let her know we're coming. Wait. I didn't agree to this. I've already told her and hung up. Let's get ready and leave once you've changed. Invitations to dinner from Kyla were unervingly frequent. In the past, she ran a cooking class and was a first-class cook, and even now, being alone after father-in-law passed away, she tended to make lavish feasts. Still, having to share a meal with her nearly half of the month was stressful, and when I tried to discuss it with Alan, Mom must be lonely by herself. Let's just keep her company for meals. He'd brush it off lightly. But when he saw I wasn't convinced, he looked into my eyes and spoke gently. Tiana, it must be hard preparing meals every day, especially with your busy job. I want you to relax a bit. Don't worry about it. All right, thank you. I knew Alan genuinely cared for me. However, my biggest concern was that the meals always included dairy products, which I'm allergic to. I've been allergic to dairy since childhood, unable to ingest milk, butter, or even bread. Accidental consumption would lead to nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Kyla's home-cooked meals were full of dairy, including stews, cream pasta, and homemade bread with plenty of milk it seemed intentional. Tiana, you're not eating anything. Don't you like my cooking? It's not that. I have a dairy allergy, as I've mentioned before. Could that be? Well, it's okay, you'll get used to it if you introduce it to your body slowly. Alan, there's more, so don't hold back and eat plenty. This pasta is awesome as always. Tiana, you should eat too. Yeah. Do these two not understand the severity of an allergy, persistently urging me to eat? However, unable to eat, I would often just sip the tea served, distracting myself from the hunger. Meanwhile, Kyla would chat happily with Alan, enjoying the meal with a beaming smile. Such incidents were common, causing me to fret over her overbearing attitude towards Alan and her problematic cooking. Once, unable to hold back, 
I brought this up with Alan. Do you think Kyla is deliberately making dishes I can't eat? That's impossible. She went through the trouble of making it, and I think it's a problem that you don't eat, Tiana. Don't say that. You understand my allergy issue. Yes, but remember, you've accidentally eaten allergens in food other than mom's cooking before? It never led to anything serious, so don't overthink it. That may be true, but... Indeed, I've unintentionally eaten dairy when dining out. Dairy is so pervasive in dishes that sometimes it's unavoidable. Yet, I couldn't help but feel malice in Kyla's cooking. Once, she served fried chicken for dinner, and thinking it was safe, I ate it, only to find out the batter contained dairy. Soon after, I was overwhelmed with vomiting and severe abdominal pain, becoming unable to leave the bathroom. Are you complaining about my cooking that much? There's a limit to sarcasm. Kyla, showing her anger, confronted me as I finally emerged from the bathroom. It's not that. I think there was dairy in the batter of the fried chicken. It made me sick. The way you say it sounds like I did it on purpose. Alan grew up on my cooking. If you can't stand it, you won't get along with him in the future. If you're going to break up, better do it sooner than later. That's a different issue. No. Even if we have grandchildren in the future, they won't grow up healthy because of your picky eating. I wanted to seek Alan's help, but he wasn't there as he was taking a shower. You should go home first. I'll tell Alan you felt sick and sent you home. That day, I went home alone, and for weeks after, the persistent invitations from Kyla ceased completely. If it meant keeping some distance, I didn't mind her disliking me. Then, a month before my birthday, Alan made a suggestion. It's Tiana's first birthday since we got married, how about we go to a hot spring? That's wonderful. Of course, I'll go. Look forward to it. The trip is my gift to you. Okay. Thank you, as always. What's this all of a sudden? I'll make it luxurious since it's a special occasion. I was overjoyed by Alan's sentiment. The reservations were made without a hitch, and all that was left was the day of the trip. However, two days before the trip, I received a call from Kyla. Tiana. It's been a while. It's unusual for you, Kyla. To contact me. What a sarcastic tone. I'm calling to host a birthday party for you. What? It's your birthday in two days, right? Melissa is coming back that day. How about we all have dinner together? Melissa is Alan's sister, currently living far away due to her job transfer. I met her for the first time at my wedding, but we haven't seen each other since. She was refreshingly bright and just from one glance, I could tell she was a good person and I wanted to talk to her more. However, Alan had planned a trip for my birthday. Can I confirm with Alan before answering? He'll say yes. You're the star, so I'll wait especially for you. Make sure to reply by tomorrow. After her purpose was served, Kyla unilaterally ended the call. I have a bad feeling about this. Despite my intuition, I had to check with Alan, so I brought up the birthday party when he got home. Melissa is coming back. That's great, let's go. But what about our trip? I was really looking forward to it. We can go anytime. But, things haven't been going well with Kyla recently, and I'm not really feeling up to it. Mom wants to get closer to you, Tiana. She wouldn't host a birthday party otherwise. It's a good opportunity to accept her invitation. All right. I understand. Disappointed to cancel the trip, I decided to attend the birthday party hosted by Kyla. On the day of my birthday, dressed a bit more fashionably, I went to her house, where a lot of homemade dishes were already laid out on the table. My sister-in-law Melissa was also busy setting plates and preparing drinks. Melissa, it's been a long time. Tiana, I'm so happy to see you. Happy birthday. Let's talk a lot today. Just like the first time we met, she was indeed a bright and charming woman. Though things weren't going well with Kyla, I felt that I could have a good relationship with Melissa. Now that everyone is here, shall we start? Tiana, 
happy birthday. We all held our glasses and toasted. It was heartwarming to receive so many well wishes. Tiana, eat as much as you like today. But we also have a cake, so don't overdo it and save some room. Mom, isn't it a bit much? It's Tiana's special birthday, of course. Seeing her smiling more than usual, I felt somewhat relieved. The homemade dishes lined up before me were extravagant, from fried chicken to potato salad, roast beef, and even a scattered sushi, quite a feast. However, I couldn't help but feel that some of these might contain allergens, and once again, I couldn't bring myself to eat much. Still, reuniting with my sister-in-law and her husband made for lively conversations and an enjoyable time. Before I knew it, the sun had set, and it was 7 p.m. Then Kyla stood up and headed towards the kitchen. After a while, the lights suddenly went out, and Kyla approached with a cake, its candles lit. Everyone naturally started singing happy birthday in unison. Despite my age, I was genuinely delighted, bashfully clapping and savoring the joy. Tiana, please blow out the candles. All right. After I blew them out, Alan turned the lights back on. Then the cake became clearly visible, and I exclaimed. Is this? Kyla's homemade cake was extravagantly frosted with whipped cream, and as if that wasn't enough, more whipped cream was piped on top, concealing the strawberries entirely. Happy birthday! Make sure you eat it all! Unconcerned about my grimace, Kyla spoke with a direct gaze and a smile. The situation was so obviously intentional that I couldn't hide my irritation. This cake. I baked the sponge myself, you know? Took quite some time, so it must be delicious. I'll cut and serve it now. Before I could respond, she was about to forcefully plate it. But this was a precious moment, and I decided it was time to be straightforward. As I clenched my fists and was about to speak, an unexpected person addressed Kyla. Tiana's allergic to dairy, right? Melissa, who had been smiling until then, asked Kyla sharply, her expression now stern. Was she? Mom, you told me over the phone before. Do you understand how dangerous allergies are? They can be fatal. Really? Didn't you realize the severity, Alan? There are many people in the world who die from eating allergens. You can't take this lightly. I was touched that Melissa came to my rescue when I was in trouble. And I was overwhelmed with gratitude for her conveying the dangers of allergies. That varies from person to person. Tiana said she can eat a little without any issues. I never said that. In fact, I've always stated I can't eat it. Don't lie. Fine. Everyone else can share the cake. If you don't like it, just watch enviously. Even after all this, Kyla refused to understand, and I was truly infuriated. Regardless, her plan was either to make me sick from eating the cake or to isolate me for not eating it. I was ready to retaliate forcefully, but once again, the situation took an unexpected turn. Mom, enough already. Did you even listen to her? What's gotten into you, Alan? This is nothing new. Don't joke around. This is life-threatening. Are you saying it's okay if Tiana dies? That's not what I mean. She's been fine eating it before. So don't be so harsh. Let's serve Alan first. Stop it. I don't want to eat a cake with malice. Tiana, I'm sorry. I should have understood your allergy better. It's okay. I appreciate you understanding. Kyla, please take the cake away. Then, she made an outrageous statement, further intensifying the tension in the room. If you're going to be like that, I'll give up on making you eat it. Instead, how about we do a face cake? You know, like comedians do on variety shows, burying their face in the cake for a laugh. In my shock, I couldn't immediately respond, but what she said next was even worse. If it's just on your face, it won't be life-threatening, right? How about we take a group photo with it? It will make a wonderful memory. That's not funny. Stop making a mockery of me. What's wrong? I'm just making a suggestion. Tiana, 
you never seem to go along with everyone else. Why would you use an allergen I can't eat in the first place? You've been doing this on purpose all this time, haven't you? So what? What's wrong with that? Alan loves stew and cream pasta. With such picky eating, how can my son be happy with you, Tiana? It's boring if you won't eat the food I make, and I'm at my limit with you. He understands my allergy and married me. It's not the same as being picky. You've been causing me trouble all this time, and I won't forgive you for that. Make a fuss if you want. If you don't like it, you can leave. Facing her unrepentant attitude, I delivered a decisive blow. Understood. I'll sever ties with you. I won't associate with you from now on. That's fine by me. It's actually a relief. I'm cutting ties with you too. Alan, what are you saying? I accepted the birthday party because I thought it was a kind gesture. I didn't give you money for the ingredients just so you could harass her. Sorry. So, stop being angry, will you? It's too late. I regret sending money every month to make your life a bit easier. I always thought the dinner invitations were a thank you for the living expenses, not to trouble her. I really misjudged you. In fact, ever since father-in-law passed away, he had been giving her $500 every month. This was out of gratitude for raising him and because she claimed the Social Security survivor benefits weren't enough. Feeling that his goodwill had been trampled on, he was furious. I have no intention of seeing my mother again. Tiana, let's go home. He immediately stood up, grabbed his bag, and headed to the entrance. As I picked up my things and was about to leave, Kyla clung to me. I'm really sorry. Please stop Alan, please. Let me go. It's too late for apologies. What you did to me constitutes assault. Be grateful I'm not pressing charges. Wait. My comfort is spending time with him. Ignoring Kyla's tearful pleas, I left the house. Walking home together, he apologized again. Tiana, I'm really sorry. I'll be more careful from now on. In the days that followed, both Alan and I received numerous calls from Kyla on our mobile phones. We ignored the dozens of calls, and eventually, they stopped. The birthday incident brought Melissa and me closer, and we started to communicate frequently. I apologized for leaving early that day. Leaving was the right choice. I would have done the same. She kindly reassured me, a gentle sister-in-law. She was also appalled by Kyla's behavior and had distanced herself. Kyla, abandoned by her beloved children and left lonely, lost the energy to cook her favorite dishes and resorted to eating ready-made meals. Spending her twilight years in darkness and solitude was her own fault. Meanwhile, without Kyla's interference, my husband and I finally had time to ourselves. He rebooked the birthday trip he had canceled, and we created happy memories. We intend to continue enjoying our life together as a loving couple.